Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, this is our third uh, CRO workshop, uh, first of the year. Um, and this workshop is about grant writing, more specific fellowship and grant writing for PhD students and early career scho scholars. This is part one before you start writing. Uh, we're gonna have several um, grant writing workshops because we cannot fit everything into uh, an hour and a half into our workshop. My name is Adriana Picarau. I am an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Um, I, I've been working with Crow for a long time. So I have experience writing um, both internal grants within the University of Arizona and external grants like the ACLS that we're gonna be talking a little bit more uh, later in the workshop. Um, as I started as an assistant professor in August, I submitted two grants, one internal, um, one external so far. I got funded, I got news last week that I got funded for the internal grant I applied. Um, yeah, I think that's it about me. Yeah, and so my name is uh, Ola Svatek. I uh, currently live in Poland. I am an assistant research professor at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, but I'm also part of the Crow research team. Um, and I um, actually got my position uh, through uh, a big grant that I got from the National Science Center uh, in Poland. Um, so this is my key uh, experience with writing grants, but I have also been part of uh, some grant activities in Crow. So um, as some of my experience also comes from that area. And I have been an international student in the US not so long ago for quite some time. So I also, understand some of that part um, of, of being an international scholar trying to get funding. Um, so I would like to share uh, that experience with you too. Thanks. Hello everyone. I am Ashley Velasquez and I'm assistant professor at the University of Washington, specifically at the Bothell campus. Um, like Adriana and Ola, I've been a part of Crow for a very long time now. Um, and I've helped with uh, the ACLS grant as well and our Humanities Without Walls grant that we received. Both of those are external. Um, as a PhD student, I applied for um, several inter internal grants at Purdue and um, received those as well. And then the biggest one being my external fellowship for my dissertation from the American Association of University Women. Um, currently, I'm working on the NCTE grant as a lead uh, PI with Adriana as a co-PI and then two other co-PIs, which we are submitting on Monday. So I spent the first couple hours of my morning doing that. Thank you, Ashley. And my name is Hadi Benat. Uh, I am an assistant professor of English at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. It's my first year as a faculty member, uh, so I can relate to your experiences as PhD students and early career scholars. During my time at Purdue, I was part of uh, two research teams. Uh, one of them is uh, the Corpus and Professor of Writing. So I've had, you know, like uh, some experience writing internal and external grants uh, that were successful and some others that were not successful, uh, as well as I've won uh, a dissertation fellowship from Purdue Research Foundation. Um, and as my colleagues pointed out, um, we are going to share our learning and our wisdoms, uh, but um, always keep in mind that grant writing is uh, or requires a learning curve uh, because the more you immerse in the experiences, the more you write grants, the better you become uh, at it. And now we're going to uh, start the workshop with Ashley, oh, oh, before Ashley, uh, basically, you know, Adriana will go through the agenda of the workshop. Thank you, Heidi. So this is an overview of what, we, of what we're gonna do today in this workshop. Um, Ashley will be talking to you about why you should apply for funding and talk a little bit about the difference between grants and fellowships, internal versus external uh, grants and how to get support for your grant application. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about what you have to do before writing up an application, what you should consider in terms of fit, uh, if, if, if you, you're always going to be talking about your um, background in terms of, um, it can be gender, it can be, you know, your research field and so on, and the grants you are thinking of applying for. 
uh, and then how to search for the right opportunity. Ola also will be leading us in an activity that we're going to be matching applications with, um, with the proposals. And then Hattie is going to be talking about how to read and annotate requests for proposals. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to be, I will be showing you a Trello, a tool, a tool to, that I use to organize my, my grant writing plans. Uh, we're going to have questions and answers at the end, but feel free to use the um, chat for questions throughout uh, the presentation. Um, I'll be filtering these questions uh, to all speakers here. So we're going to have like questions and answers throughout, uh, not only at the end. So with that, I'll pass the floor to Ashley. All right, so um, we're gonna start with why you should apply for grants and fellowships. Um, so first of all, they allow for opportunities to carry out um, innovative research and provide services to others. Um, funds from grants and fellowships provide, um, you don't need to pay them back, so that's always a plus. Um, professionalization and development of career objectives, credibility and public exposure. Winning one grant or fellowship often sets you up to win others and like, and, you know, several people have said right now, like the, the losing process is just as important to the winning process. Um, depending on your discipline and your institution, grants and fellowships may be required for promotion. All right, so grants versus fellowships. So grants cover a variety of purposes and are not, are, are not generally renewable. Um, so you might apply for a grant for conferences. I know, for example, TESOL, if you're within that area, um, they often have, um, grants that will fund your expenses and fees or travel to or lodge or lodging. Um, you can get them for research projects, whether they are for collaborative or individual funding for participants. So you can recruit participants or funding for consultants. Maybe you need a program or a developer to help you with your project. Um, professionalization and further training. So either you want to host a workshop like we're doing, um, provide a certificate program, or you want to attend a workshop um, or attain a certificate. Um, equipment for lab and research expenses, as well as community engagement and support. Fellowships, on the, on the other hand, often cover um, educational and living expenses for one person and may be renewable depending on the funder. Um, so graduate education and funding, so maybe a doctoral fellowship or a diversity fellowship. Diversity fellowships might be pretty U.S. centric. So in this, um, you might look at gender, race, ethnicity, um, or kind of the general categories. Um, Dissertation fellowships allow for PhD candidates to focus on their dissertation for a year, typically. Um, and then there are postdoc fellowships um, that will allow you to continue your research after attaining your PhD, either at your current institution or perhaps you want to go work at another institution with another scholar. And then there are early career fellowships um, that may be offered either pre or during your sabbatical. So internal versus external. Internal funding programs are funded by departments, programs, schools, or colleges at the institution of which you're a student or faculty member of. Um, internal grants are also typically focused on training students and faculty how to handle the grants in the fellowship process. So you might use this for a pilot project or a smaller research project. So we look at these as seed grants. Um, in many ways, the grant that we're working on right now, the NCT grant is a small grant, so it's $4,000. So we're looking at this as a seed grant or a pilot so that we can continue this research with a larger external grant. Um, research focused on the goals and the mission of the institution that you're within, um, funding to support writing and publishing research and or conferences. External funding programs on the other side are from outside of your institution. Um, these funding programs are often strictly dedicated to providing money to researchers, um, and they're much larger typically. So like the ACLS grant is over $140,000, I believe. Um, and so it's for much larger scale projects. Um, you can attain course buyouts, which reduces your teaching load, so you can focus on the research. Um, you might hire research assistants, um, pay for travel costs for your, your research team or others to meet up instrumentation, supplies and equipment, participant recruitment and consultant fees. Actually, can I ask a question that was asked yes. by a participant in terms of the grant money? So uh -huh. what happens to the awarded money? Is it different from grant, uh, from internal, external and what can the money be used for? You touched on that, but maybe we can expand on where you can spend money or ask where for money. You 
for internal or external? Yeah, both. Like, do there any differences? Um, so let's see. For a grant, um, we'll we'll use Crow for an example. So the ACLS grant allows us to find a developer and programmer. Um, so the the interface that we have, we need somebody who has the knowledge and the power to do that. Um, so that money goes there. Um, we can also, we've used the money to fund for participants. Um, so for collecting text, either from students or teachers, um, we want to honor their time that it takes to engage with us. Um, and so we give money as a, either as gift cards. Um, another thing that we're currently working on is we want to um, provide opportunities for teachers to become creative with their materials and develop pedagogical materials. So one way that we're thinking of using funds is to provide um, an award or grant to teachers who want to engage with us. So that's another opportunity. Um, so hopefully that adds a little bit more clarification. Um, not all grants allow you to get um, like a computer or software for your research. Oh. So that's not always fundable through that. Um, so that's something to consider as well. What are you going to say, about, Adrian? What about your fellowship? Did you have a budget for your mm. fellowship? I did have a budget for my fellowship. So my fellowship was 20 grand uh, for the year. Um, and that was only for living expenses. I couldn't use it for um, the cost of the credits for my classes or my, um, what do they call it? The credits for your PhD to do your dissertation. Yeah. Um, for your tuition, I couldn't use it for anything but rent. Um, car, transportation. I could use it for going to and from uh, conferences. I did use it so that I could go to University of Arizona as a visiting scholar um, and work with Shelly on my dissertation because she uh, was a member on my committee. Um, so there are limitations for the fellowship and they often look different from the grant. Thank you. You're welcome. Before we, before we move on, you know, like I would like to assure you that every grant institution and every fellowship has requirements regarding, you know, like the allowed expenses that we will, you know, encounter later on in the workshop when we are annotating the call for proposals. Yes. Um, so getting support for your writing. So at the University of Washington, so this comes from the University of Washington Bothell. Um, at my campus, even right after I accepted my contract, I came with my husband to look for housing, et cetera. Um, but I also met with the office because I'm interested in, in applying for grants here. Um, so they'll sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. They'll go through different internal grants that you might want to apply for. Um, they'll have familiarity with external grants. The one that I'm really interested in is uh, one of the NSF grants. So I met with someone who um, has a lot of experience with that. We went over that process. Um, so they help you locate the grant. And then when you're getting to the writing process, they often provide workshops. So at my institution, um, they'll offer workshops for several people to come and just kind of like share their um, their experiences, share the grants that they're working on and get feedback. Um, they'll give you best practices for using or for writing your grants. Um, and then there's always one-on-one. -on -one. So I have a person I can go to and like, I'm working on this grant, can you help me? I'm kind of stuck. Um, so you also get a person typically at an institution who helps with the budget and justifying your budget. Budgets are really, really important. And I think a lot of people often overlook them. Um, and I would never save a budget for the last minute, um, just so you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and then they'll help you manage your grant if you're funded. They'll let you know where the money goes, how it's been allocated, how much money you have left, where you can use it, if you can you know, move money from one pool into another pool. Um, so all of this to help you manage it so it's not as overwhelming. Yeah, so I believe it's on to Ola now. Yes. Um, okay, so my part of this workshop will deal with how to find grants and fellowships to apply to and also how when you're, you know, before you uh, actually start writing, how to think about cho choosing the best one uh, for you as a, as a scholar. Okay, so when we think about grant writing and even fellowship writing, um, oftentimes, if it's your first grant, you might just think about um, this uh, the, in the cycle we have here, you might be thinking about the first, uh, second and third part, but the grant application cycle and getting your grant is really a, a complex process. Um, so before you get funded, you might be stuck in the in these parts one be uh, so one sort of finding source for funding 
uh, to group preparation and to resubmission. And so anytime you fail, you know, like you come back to square one, but once you get a grant also, you will have to go through a lot of elements and a lot of steps. Uh, you know, the work doesn't stop there. So, so there's work before you uh, get a grant and there is a lot of work after you get a grant, including the, the project you, um, you work on. Um, but, but yes, it's a, it's a, it's a big, <laughs> big, big cycle with many steps. And um, so all of you are here because you're thinking about getting some funding, uh, whether in terms of fellowship or a grant. Um, and there's two ways to approach this process. Um, so let's say you were at the beginning of your PhD career, maybe you're a first year student, second year student, third year student in the US. That's how, how <laughs> this, the situation goes, like you have more than three years or four years sometimes. Um, and you, you have the time to um, plan in the long term. So I would advise you if you're in earlier stages of your PhD to monitor the funding options uh, years in advance. So once you join the department, you can keep an eye out for uh, information about dissertation funding, even though you're still far away from that uh, stage. And you can start thinking about um, who are they looking for? Or what are some of the requirements for these calls that are coming out? Uh, for more advanced stages. So, um, so this will help you think about your career or pre preparing yourself or even kind of engaging in activities that might make you more com um, uh, competitive for the grant later on or the, the, the fellowship because you'll be able to uh, you know, build, build a kind of identity that or resume or CV that will help you uh, get the funding you want. Um, if you're getting close to graduation, and that was my case when I was getting close to graduation, I was looking at uh, grant schemes for early career scholars, and these can be very competitive. Um, and in the US, uh, there are um, different disciplines, even in social sciences, have different uh, traditions. Um, I was looking at grant schemes in my own home country. Um, and you might, you know, like we, we might have participants from, we have participants from all over the world. And I know that there, um, in different countries, there are science centers who, who will fund and provide support for early career scholars. Um, and as I said before, you can build your CV with the aim of being competitive. So based on the recurrent calls. So it's re really never too early to start thinking about um, how to make yourself the best candidate and one of our very important part, and this might differ a little bit between American, uh, US-based and non-US-based contexts, but uh, in the US, uh, a lot of um, competitions, <laughs> different type of academic competitions, what I would call, depend on letters of recommendation. So when you apply uh, either for a job or a fellowship, you really need to have a strong letter of recommendation. So as you're starting your uh, career, you really have to think about building relationship uh, with a number of different academics in your circle. And this necessarily doesn't have to be your, just your advisor. The, uh, the, the, I guess like the more diverse pool you have, the better. And you can always think about having backup <laughs> uh, letter writers because you never know what's gonna happen in a few years if people are going to move away from your institutions. And you will definitely need someone who can speak to your um, uh, competence, uh, to your work, to the things you, you have done over the couple of years. So uh, it's never too early to think about who do you want to uh, build this relationship with. And, um, and the earlier you start thinking about it, the better. You can also contact previous winners. So if you're looking at dissertation fellowships, um, or uh, even uh, grants for early career scholars, it's easy to find names of people who have received them. So whether they are at your institution or even you know, if they're global, um, you might try to reach out and see if they would be a, available to give you some hints or share materials with you uh, because that will be very helpful in preparation for, for your own application. And uh, coming back to the letters of recommendation, um, different foundations and different um, institutions uh, have, might have particular 
uh, letter of recommendation forms. So make sure that you know, you're aware of uh, when you're working with your letter of recommendation writers, like that they are aware that there is a particular form, but that kind of comes later on. Okay. And sometimes you might find yourself um, in front of an opportunity that it, you did not predict that uh, is gonna um, present itself <laughs> in front of you. So this is a so-called ad hoc opportunity. And maybe it's because you know, you're know you graduating and you, uh, you saw information about a very interesting grant uh, scheme and it's maybe two months until the deadline and two months might sound like a lot of time, but in terms of uh, applying for grants and fellowships, it's very little time, believe me. So uh, in that situation, we really have to respond to um, an opportunity right away. There are certain things you have to be aware of. So uh, first of all, you have to um, identify, just kind of scan the, the call and see if you can identify elements of the application that require other stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean uh, reference letter writers. So the people who write you a letter of recommendation um, and you have to contact them as soon as possible uh, because uh, usually these people are very busy and they have their own schedules, right? And they need to know as, as soon as, they, as it's possible um, that they will be required to write you a letter, especially if they haven't uh, written you a letter before because oftentimes they might have a letter and model and then they adjust it to each different position uh, to a bigger or lesser extent. But if they don't have a letter ready, they will have to write it from scratch. Um, and if you need a hosting institution, so some grants are uh, require you to go to a new place and you have to get in touch with that place, see if they want you there, uh, if they have a space for you there. Uh, you'll need to contact them and, and see what their timeline is, um, especially in terms of getting uh, permissions, getting letters from them saying that, yes, they have space for you, they want you there. Um, it's also important to uh, surround yourself with friendly editors, what I call is people that uh, can work with you uh, uh, on your writing. So if you're starting to write a grant or you're drafting an outline, there, there should be someone maybe someone with similar experience to you, like if you're a PhD student, that's another PhD student, or it's your advisor uh, with more experience, they can work with you uh, on the organization, argument, copy, and then you know, proofreading. But you need to know that someone will be ready uh, to do it on a very short notice. And that's the, the key element here um, when you're uh, looking for the kind of ad hoc support uh, because as I'm saying, like some people have um, different timelines and you need someone who will jump in and help you, even if it's late at night or, you know, there's two days to deadline and somebody can lend you their fresh eyes and, and that they are not as tired with the draft as you are, because that can happen. <laughs> and um, it's also important to keep uh, archive all of your work. So if you're applying for grants, many grants, you don't have to start from scratch anytime you start, right? So you you can have um, an archive of all of your grant applications and you can copy and paste for sure. And you can reuse portions of your work because that will save you time and uh, it will help you um, kind of not start from scratch. It's kind of less discouraging <laughs> if you already have something to start with and that will help you with these ad hoc situations. And then um, another key point is to keep your CV updated. Um, and especially if you are a PhD student, uh, you're in grad school, um, just make sure that you have uh, updated CV. And you also can have an archive of different versions of documents, more with teaching oriented, more research oriented, et cetera. So maybe you can also be ready um, to, to showcase your strengths and like from different points of view. Yeah, may, may I, can I add something about that? Um, so Ashley mentioned that we're, she and I are writing um, a grant for the National Council of Teachers of English. And we are writing the narrative, already thinking that we're gonna reuse this for future uh, you know, external grants, right? So I know that with publishing sometimes, like a lot of times you are not, you shouldn't publish the same, right? Uh, narrative, but with grants, 
uh, it's kind of expected if you, if you apply to a smaller grant to actually use that as a pilot study for a, a larger grant and then you are reusing your narrative. Yes, good point. Okay, and uh, as you kind of mentioned before, uh, the difference between internal and external, external funding, but I just wanted to remind you that um, when you're searching for the right opportunity, there are kind of two paths that you can go. If you are already part of an institution, so if you, um, especially in the US, if you were in the US, that's the context I know uh, well, but other institutions for sure, uh, you can look into your uh, university and the internal funding. So college, uh, your college or your department might have funds to support uh, your small research projects or support your dissertation or even travel to conferences, etc. cetera. Um, but you can also talk to your grant office. So um, this is an office, like as Ashley was mentioning, she, she works uh, closely with her grant office because they will have also most up-to-date information about what the university offers. And oftentimes they will also have information about uh, ongoing calls from, from around the, you know, your country and also the, the whole globe too. And sometimes you can think about getting a small grant at your university as a seed grant in the sense that it'll kind of show the bigger, uh, you know, if you get the smaller grant at your university later on, if you apply for a bigger external funding, this kind of gives uh, the you know, committees in the external bigger grants this uh, kind of proof that you can manage a grant or you can win a smaller grant and you can successfully complete it. And this builds your ethos, so-called ethos, like credibility, and it, it will help you get bigger grants. So uh, you might think big and start big, you know, like if you're, um, if you're just dreaming about getting a big grant, uh, that's great. But you can also think about like uh, building stepping stones towards getting uh, bigger and bigger funding. Uh, so it's okay to be patient and it's okay to start small. And in terms of external funding, where can you go uh, to look for funding? Adriana, did you want to add something? Okay. Uh, I have a so question, but, but I can ask the question after you're done with this slide. Okay. Okay. So uh, in terms of external funding, um, I will uh, list, list briefly some uh, institutions in the US and in Europe that you can look for, but uh, these will be in, uh, external institutions, meaning outside of your university. Uh, yeah, but we can go back. <laughs> and so there are external uh, fun uh, funding sources such as non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and government institutions. Um, and you can look in the funding database bases such as grants.gov, that's an American one, uh, to look if there are ongoing open calls or calls are going to open. But um, we, we made this workshop, you know, with specific um, audiences in mind. So we're, uh, I know some of you are applied linguists, you work in English, et cetera. Uh, so you can definitely look also into your discipline specific organizations, such as AAAL, the American Association of Applied Linguistics, TESOL, ERA. So don't be afraid to, to go into these, um, you know, websites for, for these discipline specific organizations and see what kind of funding they have. So oftentimes they will provide specific funding. So my but, question before mm -hmm. you go on to the next slide. Yeah. I think it's appropriate here. So someone asked about um, the implications of for grants and fellowships for how the money is managed and income tax. So let me start by answering this question. So when you apply for an internal or an external grant, most of the time for grants, you don't, you, the money never goes to your account. It goes to someone, uh, an admin person uh, in your program or your department and they manage the money. So if you need to uh, pay incentive to participants, then you have to coordinate with them after you got the money to, for them to pay in the incentive directly to participants. So the money never goes to you. So for most grants, there is no implication for income taxes. But um, I think maybe Ashley for sure and Hadi can talk about fellowship money because in those cases, it does include living costs. So I don't know, Ashley, if you want to add. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So for the AAUW, the American Association of University Women, um, I received my funds in a stipend directly and I received it um, 
trying to remember the quantity. I think I received two stipends, one per semester. Um, and mine was not taxed when I received it. So I had to report it as income. Um, and then it was taxed afterwards. Um, grants that I've received have not been taxed. So that's not been an issue there. In my situation with an internal fellowship, uh, basically because Purdue University granted me this fellowship. So they, the Purdue Research um, Foundation would just like uh, send it to the uh, office and basically you know, this amount of money that I got was equal to the stipend that I usually get as um, a graduate uh, research assistant or a graduate teaching assistant. So for me, nothing has changed. I was basically getting, you know, like um, my regular stipend every uh, two weeks from the university. And basically the university and the uh, research foundation office dealt with the budget. And it was definitely, you know, like, uh, taxed income the same way that my, um, you know, um, my uh, assistantship was uh, taxed income. So it's a bit easier when it is a through your institution. Uh, I remember, you know, like also, you know, practically with Ashley, I do remember when she got her fellowship, she needed to budget, you know, like this amount of money throughout, you know, like uh, the years. Uh, sorry, throughout the different month that she have in, in that year and for her different expenses with me, it was just like I was I was used to the same thing and I just went on. I, yeah, I also, not for tax, but I had to report back to AAUW um, mid-year and at the end of the year how my funds were spent. Um, so I had, I kept track and it wasn't like a it wasn't a stressful process, just so you know. It's not like you have to keep like each itemized mm -hmm. receipt, um, but just kind of in general, how much did you spend on rent? How much did you spend um, on groceries or whatever? And yeah. usually you do have, sorry, Hadi. No, I'm just saying like for me, I didn't have to do that uh, because basically it was for uh, living expenses and for tuition remission. Um, so I didn't have to report to the internal, um, you know, like, um, grant office. Yes, go ahead, Adriana. Ola, for external grants, there is a question. Should you be a member of these professional organizations to apply for the grants? I think the, so, so you all might know also, I know Ashley, I think in the past also applied for some TESO grant maybe, but I think there, the answer is probably yes, most of the time. But I think there are some some ones that um, oh yeah so for TESOL now someone is saying but sometimes that you can apply and you would like part of the package might be you get the uh, uh, you get the membership too so so it isn't um, always necessary but I think for some of them it might be but yeah so NCT we, for sure you have to be a member so they're going to specify in the call for proposals that Hadi is going to be talking about. There is one more question. Um, okay, I'll, the other question I'll, we were discussing the, at the end because it's a, a more extensive question. So go ahead. Okay. okay. And uh, so if you're looking for um, opportunities, um, we as, as a team are more uh, familiar with the US as you can probably notice from our talk, but um, there are a couple of places where you can look for uh, funding. And uh, in the US, it is the National Science Foundation. Um, so although they fund a lot of you know, engineering uh, grants, et cetera, there are some grants that cover communication and uh, will fund some of the linguistics work. Uh, so you just have to really look closely. Uh, there's the National Endowment of the Humanities, which also funds uh, social science research. There is the Social Science Research Council, which actually has funding for um, international dissertation uh, fellowship. So if you're an international student in a PhD program in the US in social sciences, you might look there uh, for funding for your dissertation work. Um, if you're, you know, if your university doesn't have that kind of support. There's also for Ford Foundation that has uh, uh, fellowships for dissertation. Uh, AAUW, which uh, uh, actually is a, a you know, she got, she got the grant uh, or fellowship. Um, we also have ACLS. Oh, and I will add that AAUW also has international uh, fund, uh, funding for international women. So that's also a good program. But I, as far as I remember, it's 
uh, before you get into your PhD. It's not when you're already there, but you might kind of have, have a look at it closely. Maybe these things have changed. Uh, ACLS is also the, um, the institution that is funding Crow, the Corpus in the Repository of Writing. Um, and they have the Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowships. Um, so there is a good number of US-based um, organizations, and this is not the complete list, but this is the, like kind of the, the biggest na names in the, in the landscape. In terms of the European Union, um, and I have moved to the EU not so long ago, two years ago, uh, the European Union Research Council is a, quite a really good a place to look for grants. They are very competitive, and um, and that is the nature of grant. Um, just in get grants in general, they're oftentimes very competitive. But don't get, get discouraged. But they have schemes. Uh, they have starting grants, um, and these you can also apply from all over the, the world, basically. But you will have to do research in the EU, uh, so you can look into the Horizon Europe program, um, and they have starting grants. It's for early career scholars, but they also have more advanced grants. They have individual fellowships. Um, again, very competitive, but uh, they are looking for diversity and they are supporting women. Um, so you can definitely look into that. And national science centers um, throughout the European Union and um, you, each country usually has a national science center or a similar institution that doesn't go by that name, but it funds, uh, funds research um, within the country. And oftentimes these national science centers will collaborate together so you can get, um, get, get funding uh, and do cross in, uh, cross, uh, cross international research within the EU. Um, you can also, if you know about any cool programs uh, for early career scholars, uh, you can add, yeah, you can add it to the, to the chat. And um, a very important element of uh, writing your grant or fellowship is thinking about two, two things. Is first of all about your identity. So let's say you went to the list of uh, places I've mentioned before, you're looking for a dissertation fellowship or an early career scholar grant. Um, as you're looking at the calls, you might think about, look for um, information about what who they are looking for and, who, and kind of think about who you are. So, um, so think about uh, whether, you know, when you're looking at the grant, is there a particular citizenship that's required to get the grant? Or in the US, if you are a citizen or a green, cast, uh, green card holder, or uh, certain grants, many grants are open or fellowships are open to international students. Think about gender, race, and ethnicity. There might be uh, how you identify might be important for for the grants you're writing. Uh, how you, uh, which discipline you belong to or your project belongs to might be important. So whether you're in humanities or, so, or social sciences or somewhere in between, because some of the uh, programs that may be like uh, digital humanities kind of borrows methods from, from both. Um, check if the, there is an educational level required in the uh, rent um, that you're applying for a fellowship. Do you need to have a PhD uh, in hand by a certain by a certain date, um, or do you need to be already graduated? Because this this are some criteria that often come up in these calls, and um, there might be also requirement for length of time in the program. So you couldn't uh, be in the grad program for more than six years or maybe not more three years and not more than three years, you are not more than three years after graduation. So there are certain requirements, certain grants and fellowships will put on you that might restrict what you can apply for, but you can also use these towards your advantage. Um, but as important is, is how, uh, what the organization you're applying to, what is their identity. So it's very important that you look at their mission and aims and look um, at the history of the organization, see what they're looking for, uh, what are their aims and who founded it and why, uh, what values they represent and think about that in terms of your own identity. So what could you bring uh, if you want a grant and like how do you fit into what they are looking for and their mission? Um, and this is also <laughs> is somehow a key to success in my mind because you show them that you know 
what kind of agenda they want to achieve in the world and you can tell them how you can contribute to that agenda. Um, and then, yeah, so let's move on to the first activity. Um, I actually prepared for you um, call for applications from three different funding schemes. And also I have um, three fragments of proposal samples, actual proposal samples that won in these three uh, calls. So I would like you now, uh, we'll put it, put you in the in breakout rooms and um, you will work in a, in a group because we're very interactive. And I want you to just analyze the career stage and candidate fit for, um, for these calls and match the proposal samples to the funding calls. So first see, um, just tell us who do you think, um, or discuss among each other, who do you think is a good fit for a particular call and which proposal sample matches which funding call and why. And I'll stop sharing now so that we can facilitate the breakout rooms. And if you have any questions about the activity that Ola has, please uh, ask us. I'm uh, working on the breakout rooms, so just give me a second. And this I is a short this. activity. It's a 10 minute activity and then we'll all come back and we'll move on to the next stage. So. Um, I don't know if you all were ready for an interactive 10 minute time, but that's what you get. I'm sharing the screen for the handout directly from GitHub uh, link that uh, Adriana has already shared with you. Yeah, so, um, so you can either maybe say in the chat, um, but we have these three different one, um, calls. So the first, the Shuttleworth Fellowship. Uh, so maybe somebody can, can, you can write in the chat, like, who is this for? Um, who, who are they looking for? And which uh, writing sample do you think um, matches the, matches the uh, Shuttleworth Fellowship? So either in the chat, if somebody wants to. Okay, so we have uh, first, first answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so sample two. Okay, great. And um, any thoughts? Very good. So this is sample two. Any thoughts why Shuttleworth Fellowship and sample two go well together? Um, what, what, does, uh, what kind of character does uh, Shuttleworth Fellowship have or like what kind of profile are they looking for and how can you see it in sample two? One of my group members did a quick, uh, went to the Shuttleworth website and saw that um, on face they were talking about changing the world. So then we, we looked at the general kind of definition. Uh, no, yeah, my group member was Jeff. Um, <laughs> and thought that that was, that corresponded with the objective of the um, second sample. And it was a little bit more general in terms of its objective rather than the first and the, and the third one. So that's why we concluded that it would be Shuttleworth. Yeah, very good. So um, yeah, you pointed out all the key key information here. Um, Hello. Very good. There is a question in the chat. Is the Shuttleworth Foundation, uh, is this a real and successful grant application for it? Is yes. this foundation good for open-ended projects? Yeah, um, so uh, this is a real and successful grant application. Um, and we will actually in the handout, you have a link to ogrants.com website that has uh, a lot of samples of winning grants, which is, a, I think, a treasure trove. Uh, but this is where I uh, got it from. And this is this foundation is good for open-ended projects in the sense that um, you know they are looking for you know change like change in the world, um, and you don't really have to have academic credentials. Um, and I'm I'm sure that they won't <laughs> uh, get in the way. But uh, yeah, so it's it's good for open-ended projects. Um, very good. And then we also have maybe quickly B and C, which samples goes with B with Sonatina grant, <laughs> the one that I got. So you kind of, I'm good doing a little bit of PR for Poland. If you're interested in coming, um, we would welcome you. Um, but so yeah, so Sonatina grant, which one do you think it was? And then the third one, you can put it in the chat. Um, Cause we have left sample one and sample three. Uh, 
Okay, so somebody said for Sonatina, um, we have sample one and for, uh, for NSF, we have sample number uh, three. But actually, um, as far as I remember, and I pretty remember pretty well, it's actually sample number one is NSF. <laughs> and then the last one, Sonatina, is actually um, number three. So, so this is kind of a difference here um, in terms of um, maybe cultural a little bit too, because Sonatina um, doesn't have necessarily such a strict uh, formula. And in the NSF, you can see the typical, you know, background and that rationale element. So, um, so it's kind of the other way around. Um, but yeah, but you can see all of these are successful ones. And as I said, um, I think one of the key um, kind of skills uh, or, I mean, preparation elements is to look at successful and maybe unsuccessful grant proposals. It's very difficult to, to find these samples. And um, at the end of the handout that you have here, you have the link to uh, a database with funded and unfunded projects and, and the full proposal. So uh, this is really good resource. So thank you for participating in this activity. And if you have any questions to me, um, even after the uh, workshop, just let me know. I'm always open to talking about uh, these issues. Okay, so I'll share the screen and we will get to... Uh, we have a question okay. about where to... If Ola could repeat where the end, repository. At the end, yeah. It is at the end of the same PDF that you just work, you're just you working on. If we scroll down all to the end, there the links are there. And Ola posted uh, the, the website too in the chat. Yes. So in this part of the workshop, we're also going to work on enhanced uh, on activity. Uh, basically, we're going to annotate a request for proposal or a call for proposal. And uh, for that purpose, we chose uh, for you the American Council of Learning Societies Digital Extension Grant, which we worked collaboratively on with uh, other uh, Crow collaborators. And we won uh, this grant that funded um, a lot of, you know, like the development for our um, Crow interface. So what I would like to do now is I want to give you a general description of the activity. So basically, we divided the call for proposal into three sections, and we're going to divide you into several breakout rooms. Each group will get a section of the uh, CFP, just for the benefit of time. And basically, you're going to annotate your section uh, based on instructions that I will share with you now, and they are already in the handout. So how will you annotate? Please feel free uh, to um, use margin comments. Um, you all have access to these Google Docs that we will share with you. You can highlight important keywords and comment in the margin, even if you're doing it interactively. It's basically uh, a performance of how we work uh, collaboratively on grant writing. Highlight language you do not understand and leave a specific question. And then when we get back to the main um, room, we can answer your questions. So for the groups that will get part one of the ACLS CFP, you are going to focus on the scope of possible projects that uh, are funded by uh, uh, this grant. What are the allowed expenses in the budget? And this relates to an earlier question that came in the workshop. What are the eligibility requirements to see if you're a good fit or not, as Ola explained? And uh, I would also like you to think of the language of the evaluation criteria. And if you have any questions on that language, because basically these are the success criteria that the evaluators of the grant application or grant narrative will look at, you know, like as, as educators, we also use rubrics 
to assess uh, success in our student writing. The same thing is being happening, uh, is happening actually when we are, um, you know, submitting a grant narrative. For um, the rooms that will get the second part of the CFP, you're going to look at the project history and you're going to think about in what stage your project should be for eligibility purposes. You're going to look at the project overview and think if you know ACLS would fund an individual or a team-based uh, project. Uh, whether it's individual or team-based, as Ola mentioned, we always need collaborators. So what kind of collaborators do you need for this grant and why? And regarding infrastructure, who are possible collaborators from your institution that you need, even if they are uh, letter writers? Uh, again, whether the grant that you're working on is individual or team-based. For the groups that will get the third part of the CFP, I want you to think about what kind of sources go under a bibliography, or why do we need a bibliography for writing a grant narrative? and think about what should be included in your timeline. For budget specifications, what are the allowed expenses? Uh, the intellectual property statement is interesting because this is um, a grant that funds digital projects. So I want you to think about the requirements they list. Uh, also for project staffing, like what do you need from the people working with you on the project? You know, and this gets into your planning. Also think about who could write you the reference letters and why this particular grant requires an institutional statement. So before we facilitate the breakout rooms, I want to show you that these instructions are already in your, uh, in your handout. Just give me a second here. And basically the handout that we shared with you, if you scroll down, there is activity two, which is the activity that we will start now. So if you are getting part one of the CFP and you will notice that in the title of the Google Doc, these are the questions that will facilitate your annotations. Same thing for the people who will get part two, same thing for the people who will get part three. And I'll make sure to visit your breakout rooms if you have questions, but also I would like you to save um, your questions till the end when we get back and discuss these uh, different uh, annotations all together. So are we ready for breakout rooms? I think everyone is back. Okay, great. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, I've had a chance to visit all the rooms and I've noticed, you know, like you were uh, interactively engaging in the activity. I just want to say that we have five minutes to uh, discuss as, as, a, as, as a big team, but then, you know, like for the questions that we cannot cover, we will cover them at the end of the workshop. Um, you know, as we connect, you know, questions in this section of the workshop to other uh, content. Uh, so, what would you like to share with us? Questions, comments that you have, reflections upon the activity that you did? Yeah, may I go please? Yes. Uh, the first point was that uh, I know what is uh, technological um, sustainability and institutional sustainability, but intellectual sustainability was a new concept for me. I would really appreciate a little bit of elaboration on that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So we're thinking here, you know, like as, as, as we're funding a project, you know, what they are interested in is how this project that uh, you, we're funding, which is like, I'll give you an example, which is Crow, the Corpus and Repestry of Writing, where we are, you know, collecting student writing from classes and we're collecting pedagogical materials. Like how, how does this project stimulate intellectual sustainability for, in the long run? For whom? You know, who are the stakeholders? Who are our audiences? We can think of students, we can think of educators in the field, we can think of researchers who can use your resource for doing their work, whether they are practitioners or whether they are researchers or maybe administrators who can benefit from this resource or students themselves 
that can help them with their own writing. So when you think of the of intellectual sustainability broadly, always think about the audiences, always think about what the project provides, and always think about the fit between your project and the um, the grant program. Oh, thank you very much. Also, I would like to add is also, it goes back to what we said about applying to a smaller grant using that project as a pilot study to apply to a larger grant, right? Sustainability, I always think about how can you keep this going? How, how is like for corpus linguistics specifically, a lot of corpus projects, they, they are, they make a small project for a year and then they is never updated, right? So how can you keep producing um, either papers or improving on your project for the long term as well? Great, I see. Thank you. Other questions, other comments? I also was curious about the IRB in case this project also involves some minoritized, marginalized populations, if the call for proposals also, you know, considers that part of it, because I don't think that I was able to find that part. Uh -huh. So you were, you were working on a specific uh, part of the CFP uh, mm -hmm. and your question is basically, you know, like if this, if this grant program is funding uh, minority populations, uh, why isn't it mentioned in the CFP? Yes. Yeah, maybe I actually, this came up recently with Ashley yeah. and I. Yeah, um, so one way, so in the NCTE grant, it says, Part of the formatting for um, what to include in the proposal. So it's not in the CFP itself, it's in what to include in the proposal. They ask specifically about ethical considerations of research. Um, so even if they didn't ask that, because Adriana and I are very considerate about our ethical approaches and we have lots of conversations about it, um, we did mention like how we are going to do it. So our, our grant is looking at workshops um, and we're going to be collecting data from um, community college instructors. Um, and so we want to make it really clear that community college instructors can um, opt out at any time in the sequence of workshops and interviews. Um, and not only can they opt out, but they can ask to remove data that's related to them from the workshops. Um, they can review our findings and our results to make sure that we are ac um, accurately and respectfully representing their um, perspective and experiences. Um, so there, there are ways to do that. So while we don't have an IRB right now, our intention is to start writing the IRB. And we wrote our grant in such a way that it'll be really easy to put all that information into an IRB um, when it's time to do that. So in summary, included ethical considerations in your yes. narrative, saying you're going to apply for IRB and that uh, participants will give you informed consent and that they're gonna, they can say, I don't want to participate anymore. It's mm -hmm. always a good idea to include that. And Naseeba, for, for projects that already have an IRB approval, like for example, Crow Sense, you know, we're collecting student writing and pedagogical materials. We, we already work with an IRB approval, then it's good to mention it and not take it for granted that, you know, like uh, the grant reviewers would know that. And, you know, that's one of the supporting documents that you can include if, you know, like there is a space of the, in, like space for additional materials to be uh, attached. And if not, you can definitely, as Ashley and Adriana said, uh, mention it in your grant narrative. Thank you. Thank you. This is really helpful. Thank you for your question. Other comments, other reflections, other questions? I think we need to wrap up. Okay. So to wrap up, you know, like uh, uh, basically what I want you to be thinking of as uh, Ashley and Ola uh, mentioned at the beginning, there is always a timeline that you have to design, whether you are writing a small, large internal external grant or a fellowship. And this timeline, we divided into it into a planning phase, writing phase, and submission phase. And you've noticed that this workshop is only on the planning phase. So in your handout, you know, like we suggested um, a breakdown for the planning phase, a breakdown for the writing phase, and a breakdown for the submission phase. Uh, we would appreciate it if you look at it like later on and, you know, like as you are working on your grants, think of 
if you're going to use the same thing or you're going to customize it for the purpose of the grant or fellowship that you're applying for. As my colleagues mentioned, always it's important to look for samples of successful proposals. Some of these are published on the website of um, uh, the grant institution. Others do not, um, you know, like um, publish samples, but they um, list the names of grant awardees. So it doesn't really harm to reach out to them when possible by email with a specific question, specific asks. You might be surprised that some of them are ready to um, reply and respond and share their experiences with you. Since this process of writing a grant requires not only intellectual labor, but emotional, psychological, and physical labor as well. At this point, I would like to pass on, um, you know, uh, to uh, Adriana, who's going to discuss the next steps. Thank you, Hadi. I think you can stay, just uh, show the next slide and stay there because we are kind of out of time. So there is a link, I'm gonna share a link with you if you want to look at what I use to organize grants. Um, but yeah, you don't just keep sharing. I don't have time to talk about it. So how do you just share this slide so I can oh, okay. talk about it, about the, the, the black steps. But basically, like Hadi said, like applying to grants can be very emotionally, uh, it, it can be ex exhausting. Um, so, my after you plan for it and you know what what grant to apply for um you look at the call for proposals and you have a plan write it out start early start if you think you need, need six months right start 12 months prior you need much more time than you think you do so start early uh, get feedback from people outside your research area getting feedback from your colleagues is great but many times the people who are reviewing the grants are not in your specific research area. So make sure you're writing your grant to a broader audience and be prepared for disappointment. Not being funded is more common than being funded, but you can always use the feedback uh, you get from the grant reviewers to make your application better. And apply, apply, apply. Uh, so if 30% of your grants uh, get accepted, you need to apply for, for a, a lot of grants to get one grant accepted. Uh, so we are at 11.30. If you want to stay for questions, uh, you're welcome to. So we do have, um, if Ola and Hadi and Ashley can stay a few minutes for more questions. Course, okay, yeah. so one of the questions that we got, and you can add your, if you want to stay uh, past the 11, the 30 past the hour uh, time, you're welcome to. Uh, so the question was about, um, why the ability to get external funding grants has been added to job requirements, you think? So we've all been in the job market recently uh, and we see that ability to get external funding. Why? The requirement for it, right? Yeah, for job applications. Um, for job applications. I think it depends on the institution that you're applying to. So um, for example, if you're applying to a, a research intensive school, they might have requirements for grant applications that you're going to either your intention to apply for grants, a history of applying for grants, um, or how you want to fund specific um, projects. So I would say like the University of Arizona, depending on your discipline, um, I think particularly like computer science, right, Adriana? Like you'll see a lot more grant writing in that area perhaps than you would specifically within a strictly English department. Um, so hopefully yeah, it that depends. That. Yeah, it depends a lot on the department. Some departments will require, a applied linguistics department, I've seen a lot of them asking for uh, the ability to get, secure external grants. In the United States, I think that's where the direction of uh, higher education is going. And then the mm -hmm. other question is related. Can we put in our CV the grant information we apply for even if we didn't receive it? Yes. 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 So I have definitely seen people add uh, that uh, line to their CV saying, and with the annotation that it was funded or unfunded. But I will uh, just, if I can add uh, one thing to the previous question about why um, grant application is required at some jobs, I would also just say 
politically about the erosion of support of like public funding for just universities in general and then they are assuming you are going to bring money just because how how the budgets are changing and how over the years that support has changed especially in the united states because it it is different somewhat in europe but in um even in poland uh now for assistant professor jobs they um require you to show that you are thinking and applying for money and I do definitely think it's it's just about neo neoliberalism and, <laughs> and 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 it's not a good necessarily uh, um, trend but um, I think we can change it as we work in these institutions maybe somehow and I, so I also want to add that you know like disciplines like the humanities are also learning from disciplines in the sciences how because you know like how to be capitalistic and engineering and stem <laughs> it's a requirement to win a grant and to mm -hmm. fund your graduate students and you know like there's more funding you know for that in the sciences and thinking about the defunding of the humanities and thinking about you know like what they're learning from other disciplines now it is um it counts like a publication or even you know, like better than a publication at certain institutions when you have a big grant because you're getting also people to work with you and their students to work with you and it adds to the prestige of the program and the prestige of the department. Yes, and it brings money to the university, right? Yeah. Uh, also on the CV, yes, you should uh, write because of that reason, because people do want to see that you are thinking of applying for grants, even if you didn't get them, put them in your CV. Uh, many times you're going to say you didn't get the funding, but you were in the short, you were shortlisted, put that information out there so you can show people that you are thinking and you're working on writing grants. Um, so another question, would it be ethical to apply for several grants with the same narrative at the same time? So what I can say about this is that you apply for a grant and then you forget about it and then you're funded and then you have to do what you promised. You said you're gonna do like you know, um, so I wouldn't apply for several grants with the same narrative for the same project uh, because I don't think it makes sense in many ways because um, you're gonna get funded and then you go funded for that specific project. Um, so I always think about how to do this. Like if you get denied, then apply for another grant. Um, and if you get accepted, then apply for a great, a, a larger grant, right? So I don't think it's a good idea to apply for several grants at the same time with the same narrative. But I don't know what other things. You know, I, I, I want to just add an addendum to that. That there's a like if if we make a distinction between grant and fellowship. So fellowship, yes, yes. Um, although I wouldn't say copy and paste. <laughs> um, each uh, call will have like different requirements that they want. Um, I applied to several fellowships and I know Hadi did too um, during my fourth year and it was just always a reiteration but each application required me to think about my research, my methods, my approach and different ways that ultimately just made things a lot better. So for the fellowship process, yes. For the grant process, not so much. Yeah, and I would like to add to that and this is, you know, along with the discussion that we had today you're always tweak like you're keeping an archive of materials, but you're also tweaking the narrative for the program of the grant or the fellowship because they differ. You will not find two mm -hmm. fellowships or two grants, two grant institutions that require the same thing. And this is why you need to think of your fit and how to tweak. But as, as Ashley said, I applied to Ford, I applied to Spencer as external fellowships. I didn't get either, but I got feedback that helped me apply for the internal fellowship at Purdue. And I had to tweak and integrate this feedback. So my unsuccessful fellowship applications, you know, boosted my success potential for, you know, another fellowship, even if it's an internal one. And then last question that we have, uh, what is the success, success rate of single versus group grant application? I, I would say it depends on the the grant if it's an internal or external grant i don't know if ola ola, ola muted herself so maybe she yeah. yeah i know for example for the european union grants it's like one percent anyway <laughs> so um but i think the way to approach this when you think about applying as a group i think you will always have you know if, if this is a competition maybe where you're like competing with in other individuals versus you're competing with just groups you can think about your group as having certain 
skills and abilities and credibility and bringing, um, depending who's in that group, like they will bring certain expertise um, and that make, might make you more competitive for sure. Um, so I always think about it as, as kind of ethos building and credibility building when you're applying. And, and especially in the group, you have a lot of opportunities to, to partner with people that uh, will make you more competitive for the grant just because of the profile they have. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't have particular statistics and I'm sure it just also varies between the different programs. Um, yeah. True, because, because some, some grants also require you to be a team. And even mm -hmm. if you're applying for, for a grant on an individual basis, as you know, like my colleagues, you know, pointed out, it's always good to think of these collaborators who might not be included in the grant, but they're ready to read it, they're ready to give you ideas, they're ready to contribute to the conversation and think about who these people are and why. And think of people in your discipline and also related disciplines because you always have to write to a broader audience. So having feedback from different audiences would also help in enhancing your narrative. Yes. Thank you so much. We're almost 10 minutes past our, our allotted time. So thank you for coming. Uh, watch for an email thank from you. me in the next few days with the link to the recording, link to the materials, and a link to a survey. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.